So we're in the third week of this Unleashing Compassion series. Week one was all about how God unleashes his compassion towards us and in a way that causes him not to count our sins against us. Week two was about how can we unleash compassion on those closest to us because we kind of all admitted last week that sometimes we withhold compassion from those we love the most, right? And we said there are some things that are standing in the way of the compassion we want to give to people close to us that actually hold us back from giving that compassion in our lives and we wanted to understand both of these two weeks prior that we want, we want to do this, right? We had a desire. Anybody want God's compassion in your life? Anybody? Anybody want to learn how to be more compassionate to those closest to you, roommates, spouses, kids? Yeah. Well, the one today, you're probably not going to put your hand up. Today's topic is just as crucial, but I don't think any of us have a desire to actually do it better. The title for today's talk is Us and Them. The tagline is this, Unleashing Compassion on Our Enemies. Who wants to do that? Come on. Yeah, me either. There are some things I do want to unleash on my enemies. Anybody else? Come on. Too honest? I mean, I've wanted to unleash some words. I say like I want to, like I've never done it. That's awesome, Ben. So I have unleashed some words on enemies in the past. I, I want to unleash revenge and retribution on some anybody, enemies. Anybody else? Yeah, there are only two of us that have enemies and want to kill them at times. It's precious. I've wanted to unleash something on someone that puts them in their place because of how they hurt me or because of they hurt somebody else. There are all kinds of things I want to unleash on my enemies, and I'm guessing, if you're honest, and I'm not sure that can happen today, but if you're honest, I'm assuming there are some things you want to unleash on your enemies as well. But compassion? That doesn't make my top 10 lists. That doesn't make my top 10,000 lists. But I'm not as good as the rest of you. There are so many things I want to unleash on my enemies and have someone else unleash on them, but compassion doesn't make my list, doesn't make yours. But it's this critical teaching Jesus wants to give us today, no matter where you are. What he wants to say to us today, and we'll get there, is there's this distinctive about the kind of people who follow him, they do things the world would never expect. And that's what he's wanting to point out in our lives. We have different categories of enemies, if we can be honest. We have personal enemies, right? People who have blessed you, people who have hurt us personally, people who have attacked us personally, people who fired us personally, people who divorced us personally, people who gave us a ticket for parking on the right side of the street, <laughs> people that have broken into our homes, people that have broken into our cars, people that got our parking space when we kind of had that assigned to us, we thought from God, right? Like, there is a God. No, there's not. You know, like we, we have all kinds of enemies that are personal, but we also have uh, impersonal enemies. My assumption is that some in this room have made the president their enemy, and most of us, I guess, don't know him personally. Some of us, we lost our job because the big company came in and bought our company for some reason. I don't know why. They decided I wasn't needed anymore, and so in the most impersonal way possible, we have made a company our enemy, right? And so we're boycotting them, and until we really need something they have, and it's like, oh, okay. Oh. But here's what I've seen lately, and I wonder if you've seen it. Our pool of enemies has grown so much lately. Because we decided, it's not just people that hurt me personally. Here's who we decided to make our enemies. People who don't vote like we vote. People who don't value what we value. People who don't even believe what we believe. And people who see the world very differently than we see the world. And before we get into this big talk about how we can unleash compassion on our enemies, I think we have to make a statement to get going. And here's that statement. We have made it far too easy for someone to be our enemy. We have lowered the bar for being our enemy so low that almost anyone gets in, right? And, and if you're like me, I can think of all kinds of enemies, right? If I'm driving a car, everyone walking in on a bike is an enemy. Agreed? Like, they're so stupid. Like, sorry for the kids. That are, like, I, like, what are they thinking? But when I'm on a bike, no one can drive and the walkers are in the wrong lane. And when I'm walking, these people driving cars, don't they know that I, it may hit zero, but I'm still going. <laughs> but if I'm the driver, I'm like, I can't believe it. The countdown's over. What are, you, what are you doing? Right? We have so many enemies. But here's what I find seriously fascinating. A lot of the hatred being spewed by us today is hatred aimed at people for this one reason, because we are so 
furious that that person or that entity or that company or that system or that group or that religion lacks compassion. Just think about this with me. One of the reasons you and I become furious, especially in this season, if you would agree, we become furious with people because they've lost all compassion. Let me ask you, is it helpful for us to lose compassion because everyone's lost compassion? The hatred that's being spewed, they should care. They should care. That is true. And we'll talk about passion a little bit later, passion and compassion. They should care. But we start hating individuals or groups or systems or companies or religions because we see those things as having no compassion. And so you lose your compassion, you say, because they've lost theirs. But remember this, friends, we are not after what people deserve. We're after this, helping people orient their entire lives around Jesus. And we want to be people who center our lives around Jesus. I'm not after what everybody deserves because I don't want what I deserve. What I'm after, what you and I are after as people who follow Jesus, if that's your lot in life right now, what we're after is orienting our lives around him. So When it comes to unleashing compassion on our enemies, we need to see what did Jesus say about that? How did he live that? And how did he die that? If you have a Bible, Matthew chapter 5. If you need a Bible, raise your hand and someone on our team, because we have a team, will get you a Bible so you can track with us. Matthew 5, 43 through 48. As you turn there, go ahead and stand. I will read these six verses. And we'll go from there. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 is the longest public sermon or teaching or discourse Jesus ever gave. And so when you look at all three chapters, it's one sermon. Uh, If you think I'm long-winded today, not as long. But he usually didn't teach for a long time, but this one he taught, he, he just covered everything. And in verses 43 through 48, he says this, You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. You may be seated. Jesus is saying that there's a kind of love that can be fine, that can be okay, that can be good, but it won't set you apart if you just love the people who love you. But if you love your enemies and if you bless or pray for those who persecute you, that will stand out, right? That will be distinctive. That will be a difference maker. If you love someone who doesn't love you, that's, that will be interesting, That will grab someone's attention. That might grab a city's attention. If enough of us are doing that kind of love and that kind of blessing and praying, it might even grab the attention of a larger group than just your one enemy. And Jesus says that if you love those who love you, like, what good is that? What good is that? Let's be honest. If after this teaching today, I'm in the lobby You're trying to avoid me, but you can't. Just not that big of a space. And you come to me and you say, Ben, that was the most amazing talk I've ever heard, and I don't even believe the Bible. Or you said, Ben, you are looking great as you head to your next birthday, or whatever. You know what I would do? I would find a compliment for you. I was like, you think I'm awesome? Internally. I I think you're awesome. That's a great shirt. But if on your way out you say, that's like the worst thing I've ever heard. That was a waste of my Sunday morning. And Ben, I don't have time to waste. That was terrible. And I'm like, have you seen your outfit? (laughs) I know everything goes in San Francisco, but really? Right? Because that's what we do. We love to kind of be a mirror for people. So they give us something, and that's our natural inclination. We give compliments to people that we don't think anything great of, but because they've sort of propped and puffed us up, we want to go, what can I say nice about them? But, oh, if they come after us, if they attack us, if they criticize us, then all of a sudden we are going to find the worst thing about them. And Jesus is saying that won't stand out at all. He says, if you love your enemies, you will show yourselves to be children of the Father. 
Now, anytime you read anything, if you begin to read the scriptures or you're in a habit of doing that, anytime you read one sentence or one statement, even from Jesus, you always want to ask yourself, how does that line up with everything else he said? So when Jesus says, if you show compassion towards your enemies, you will become a child, a son or daughter of God the Father, he he doesn't mean, he he doesn't mean figure out a way to be compassionate and then God lets you in. Does that make sense? Because you you, you need a source of your compassion. And I can't generate something in myself that I need God to give me so that I can distribute to you. you. You see, we know that God's grace through our faith in Jesus alone is what makes us a son or daughter of God. And that identity for you, that eternal identity for you, can be secured today. So what he actually must mean is that if you love your enemies, it will show yourselves, not make you, it will show yourselves to be a son or daughter of your heavenly Father. Why? Because this God, he causes the sun to rise on the good and the bad. He allows the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous, that God shows loving compassion towards those who aren't yet on his side and who may never be on his side. That's the kind of love that will stand out. That's the kind of love that will be different. He's like the tax collectors do to others what they do to them, right? Right? And so there would be nothing special about God if he only loved people who made his team some effort way. And there would be nothing distinctive or special or unique about us if we only love people who love us or if we only love people who are like us. And would you agree with me that there is more us in them than there's maybe ever been in our time? Some of you have lived a lot longer than I have. Others much shorter. Okay, not much shorter, a little shorter. But there's more us in them than ever before. So let me ask you this. Like, who's your enemy? Who's your enemy? Is it simply the person that's having success when you aren't having so much success? Is it the person that broke into your car or your home? Is it someone who didn't believe everything that you believed? Is it someone who voted differently than you voted? In San Francisco, there aren't many people that did vote differently than you voted, probably, unless you're one of the ones that voted differently. Get back to the notes. Get back to the notes. How did it go? Uh, People who value differently than you value, people who see the world differently than you see the world, and those, some of those, you've made those your enemies, and they're general, but you really feel like this angst or even this anger or this lack of compassion, or you're really anti whoever is represented by that group or that specific person. But let me ask you this. Who are the personal enemies that you have? Like, they didn't attack a system that you're a part of. They didn't attack a political party that you're a part of. They attacked you. Maybe it's a boss or a former boss. Maybe it's a spouse or a former spouse. Maybe it's someone that you thought was going to be in a strong relational place with you for the rest of your life. Maybe even a mom or dad. But but now, believe it or not, they're your enemy. Who's your enemy? Dr. Martin Luther King was a lot of things. And one of the things that oftentimes gets overshadowed was the reality that he was a pastor. He was a pastor. Like his whole impetus for what he led out in came from his understanding of who God was and what God did with his enemies. And one of his own favorite sermons he ever preached, because we all have our favorite sermons as preachers, one of his favorite sermons was titled Loving Your Enemies. And while he was imprisoned in July of 1962, he revised that message. And you can read the entirety of it online, but let me give you the application points he made in that sermon. Here's the question he asked. You'll see it on the screen. He he said in that message, how do we love our enemies? He said, number one, we must develop and maintain the capacity to forgive. We must develop and maintain the capacity to forgive because he says, if you can't forgive, you can't actually love. Oh, you can love people who are like you. You can love people who treat you well. You can love people who compliment you, but you'll never love the kind of love that he's talking about. And he's referencing Jesus in the same passage, by the way. He he taught on Matthew 5 that day. Number two, we must recognize that the evil deed of the enemy neighbor, the thing that hurts, never quite expresses all that he is. I love that line. We must realize that the enemy neighbor... The person that represents the thing that we're abhorred by, the person who represents the thing that we're so against, because he would say, because I think God's so against it, the person that represents that thing, we must realize, he goes on to say, that an element of goodness is found even in our worst enemy. 
Some good exists in the worst of us, and some evil exists in the best of us. Some good exists in the worst of us, and some evil exists in the best of us. But what we want to do is categorically say that people are 100% this or that, don't we? Number three, we must not seek to defeat or humiliate the enemy, but to win his friendship and understanding. This is the ideal, right? We all know that even when he accomplished what he accomplished for so many, he didn't win the friendship of so many. And I don't think this is about the person who hurt you, attacked you, whatever, about you becoming their best friend. But I do think it's about not trying to humiliate someone because remember, it won't be worth us losing compassion because someone already lost their compassion. It won't be worth that. He said it this way to try to give a distinction. He said, while abhorring segregation, we shall love the segregationalists. While abhorring, while denouncing, while being so passionately against segregation itself, we should love the segregationalist. And one of the things we do is we make the thing the person, and we go after the person rather than the thing. But we should want, he would say, good for the person, but definitely we can be passionate about the thing. Larry Osborne is a mentor of mine, and I was with him and some other pastors two weeks ago in Chicago, and we were talking about just the cultural landscape of our day. He's a pastor in the San Diego area, and he said this that I thought was profound. He said, our passion often drowns out our compassion. Have you seen this? Our passion often drowns out our compassion. He is not saying don't be passionate. I think Jesus wants us to be passionate about the things that are close to his heart. Things like justice, things like love, things like unity, things like immigration, things like, we can go on and on and on. I think God wants us to be passionate about it because without passion, nothing amazing happens. But don't be so passionate or have passion so present in your life that compassion goes AWOL. Have you seen this? We're so fired up that we drop compassion to pursue a cause. But what if we pursued the cause passionately, but pursued the person compassionately? We want the worst to happen to our enemies. We don't just want the issue to change. We would be okay if the worst thing possible happened to our enemies. Is it a person for you, or is it a kind of person? Is it someone of a particular religion? Is it someone of a particular race? Is it anyone associated with a police department? Who is it? Is it government in general? Is it government specific? Who in your office has become an enemy of yours? They could have given you the promotion. Instead, they're keeping you down. Who's your enemy? I think Jesus especially shows us how to love and unleash compassion on our enemies with how he died. In Luke 23, verse 34, the first part of it, as he's being crucified, that agonizing way on the cross, he said this, Father, forgive them. Forgive who? Father, forgive the people who are driving these spikes into my hands and feet. Forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. That's a bit of compassion being unleashed, right? How could Jesus, while he's being crucified, unleash compassion on the very ones who are crucifying him? Well, Ben, because he's Jesus. Okay. But I want to give you what I think was his strategy and what I think was his secret to being able to unleash compassion on his enemies in hopes that we might employ the same tactic in unleashing compassion on our enemies. You guys probably know, but Jesus called 12 people to follow him initially, called the first 12 disciples or the apostles. And then he had three on the inner circle, and three of those uh, on the inside were Peter, James, and John. And Peter knew Jesus so intimately, even though he denied him, even though he let him down. After the resurrection, Jesus restores Peter, and then Peter, in our Bibles, we have two letters written from Peter. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23, he gives us what I think is the secret for how Jesus unleashed compassion on his enemies. And it's a tactic that we can use in our own lives if we understand it properly. Here's what it says. 1 Peter 2, 23. When they hurled their insults at him. So the people who are crucifying Jesus, when they hurled their insults at him, when they mocked him, when they said to him, if you're the son of God, save yourself. If you're the savior, Are you sure? You can't even save yourself. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. 
Understatement of the year, but he's a better man than me. Than you. When people call me out, oh, Ben, are you really? Show me. I'll show you. And for a couple of weeks, everyone else will see what I showed you. You know what I mean? When they hurled insults, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, instead meaning, instead, here was his strategy. Instead of retaliating, instead of making threats, instead of getting himself off the cross and going after them, instead, he employed this strategy. What did he do? He entrusted himself to him who judges justly. What did he do? If I need my enemies to vindicate me, or approve of me, or think I'm significant, or agree with me, I will never unleash compassion on them. Jesus could unleash compassion, according to Peter, because he wasn't looking to his enemies to define him. He already had a secure identity that the Father had given him, and there was no other voice was going to speak anything else that he would assume would be true about him over his life. That's why he's still on the cross. They're going, hey, if you're the Savior, why don't you save yourself? He's like, because I'm going to save you because I know who I am. And what if that's what stands in the way of you and I unleashing compassion on our enemies? What if we quit letting them have the loudest voice in who we assume we are? What if we quit letting them define us and we quit letting them determine how we're going to look at ourselves? What if we're going to allow the Father who is in heaven, who calls me son, who calls you daughter, what if we're going to allow him to be the one that defines us in such a way that I don't need you to define me? Like, you can disagree with what I do. You can criticize me. You can have a problem with the way I vote, the way I value, the way I believe. You can have a problem with all of that, and I can still love you because my identity isn't dependent on you. One of the greatest challenges in my own leadership over the last several years is in my early part of leadership, I, I, would, I, would, I would oftentimes not stand up for what I need to stand up for when people are pushing back. And, and then I moved to, to a new place where uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to stand up, but I'm not going to do it in a compassionate way. Anybody else? First you're like too soft, then you're too hard. But you know where I, I've got to go now, where I've got to go next, is being passionate about the thing that is true, about the thing God has for me, about the thing God has for my family, about the thing that God has for us, but to be compassionate with those who don't want to get on board with that and want to be against it and want to be anti everything that we're for. And I will only do that to the degree that I believe that God has secured an identity for me and I don't need you and I don't need an enemy and I don't need anyone else to vindicate me. I've been vindicated. If you're a follower of Jesus, you know exactly what it's like to be a part of a transaction where someone unleashes compassion on their enemies, don't you? Paul, another one of Jesus' followers, said this in Romans 5.8. He says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, while we were the them when God was the us, while we were on the other side, while we weren't on God's team, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know exactly, if you're a follower of Jesus, you know exactly what it means to have compassion unleashed on someone's enemy because at one time, you and I were the enemies of God. As we close this down, I want to give you three kinds of responses that I think are appropriate uh, for every person in this room, one of the three at least. The first one is this. If you've just for the first time today realized that God loved you when you weren't on his side, uh, I think your response is to open your heart up to this God who loved you. You're working so hard trying to get him to love you, trying to win a position on his team, and he wants to tell you today you can't win a position on his team, but you don't have to. Jesus has won that position for you. Just open your heart and receive that. Second thing that I think is huge for some of us in this room, who needs to be removed from your enemy list? We've made the standard too low, so who needs to be removed? What kind of person? What kind of person that doesn't agree with you? What kind of person that works for whatever, is having success and you're not? Who needs to be removed from your enemy list? And the third kind of response, because I still think we will be left with enemies, is... Which of your enemies will you pray for in this moment? Not later on, if you think about it. Not right before you go to sleep. In this moment, I want to give you some space to pray for your specific enemy. And then church, let me ask this of us. Jesus had enemies, right? We know that. Jesus never self-selected as an enemy. We're going to have enemies, but may it not be because we're self-selecting to be the enemy. People are going to self-select, right? They did what Jesus had to tell the truth. That made him an enemy to so many, but he never went in hoping to be an enemy. Does that make sense? If we're going to have enemies, and we are, let's represent Jesus well as a church community, especially in this hot topic cultural landscape, and let's make sure that we're not the ones self-selecting to be the enemy. 
But as we realize we have enemies, let's go and do what Jesus has done for us. With me? Let's pray. God, thank you so much for the way you love us, the way you loved us before we were on your side, the way you loved us before we cared or had an interest in living for you. Thank you for sending Jesus. Jesus, thank you for not doing what I would have done on the cross, for not doing what most of us would have done in that moment and retaliated. Instead, you just stayed because that was the whole point of your mission. It wasn't to get yourself off the cross. It was to die for your enemies. And so for those that need to open their heart and receive what you've done, I pray that they would in this moment. God, for those who need to remove some types and categories of people off their enemy list, God, may we not self-select as enemies. And then thirdly, God, I pray that you would give us the courage that you know we need to pray for the person who's hurt us, the person who antagonizes us, the, the, the person who said words that we can never get out of our minds. We don't anticipate being best friends with them, but God, would you get a hold of them? Would you bless them? God, give us a desire that's different than the desire we normally have when it comes to our enemies. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to ask you to stand. Maybe you're still praying for that person. I know that's not easy. Justin and the team, they're going to lead us in a song that just says what we want God to do, not just for the people who are like us and who like us, but for the people who consider themselves and we consider to be our enemies. Let's pray this and sing this over them.